Welcome everybody, we'd like to get started. We have an ambitious agenda today. As you know, we have Parents Weekend coming up on Friday and Saturday, and we look forward to welcoming many families to campus. Friday's dinner will be here in Tisch Fieldhouse. We hope you enjoy some rest on Sunday and Monday and a recharge when we resume next Tuesday and head into the final month of the academic year. Today's chapel will begin with Noel Batista. Noel. Hi, my name is Noel Batista and I'm a four-year senior from Belmore, New York. When I was a kid, baseball came easy to me and there was nothing I wanted to do more than be on that field. I proudly and confidently told my teacher I wanted to be a baseball player when I grew up and she rolled her eyes like she heard this response a million times before and got my classmates to laugh like they knew something I didn't. Not only did I love baseball, but I was invested in it, and so were my parents. They bought me every piece of equipment you could imagine and put me on the best club teams around. As kids, we don't really appreciate the financial burden and time commitment our parents sacrifice to put us through sports, and I'll always be grateful to my parents for allowing me to play the sport I love. All four seasons of the year, it was baseball, baseball, baseball. Baseball was a constant, and it definitely taught me many life lessons like dealing with pressure, failure, and success. You fail a lot in baseball. You learn to manage stress and emotions and how to overcome adversity. Despite these lessons in many ways, baseball limited me too. Instead of focusing on school or becoming an independent young adult, I was blinded. Blinded by a single image of myself and my future. I found myself and hid myself in this game. Baseball didn't teach me that I could be anything I wanted, rather that I didn't have to try to be anything else. I thought I could coast through good life on baseball alone. I didn't develop a love for learning early in my life, and that feeling carried throughout my years in school. I was often categorized in a group of students who were just average, and I deserved that categorization because I was just way too focused on baseball. Usually you learn to transfer the character traits you develop on the field into the classroom, but I just didn't get that back then. I was never encouraged or motivated to travel deeper in thought or had the time to really focus on my education. I would rush home from school each day for practice all afternoon. And it wasn't just school that I was missing out on, but also regular teenage experiences like working. While my friends got their first jobs, my schedule never seemed to allow time for a work schedule. So I would ultimately end up not working at all and leaning on my old friend, baseball. The older I grew, the more frustrated I became. I started to realize how dependent I was on baseball, always expecting that everything in life would come from it. I needed a change. I had no idea the quick impact Suffield Academy was going to have on me. When I got here, it seemed to me that school would just be a hobby while I focused on getting ready for the season. But that changed as soon as I got in the classroom. Here there was no hiding, no excuses. In the past, I had teachers who put me in a box because I was an athlete, and that somehow meant I was less academically driven, or worse, less academically capable. I definitely kept myself in that box. In freshman year, I did not realize how many people would care about me being, care about me outside of being a baseball player. When I started failing my classes, skipping the hill, and even hiding from my teachers in row, Mr. Brissett, Mr. Atkins, and even unfortunately, Mr. Lynch were all there to hold me accountable. <laughs> they each let me know in their own unshakable and terrifying way that if I intended to stay at Suffield, I needed to be more. Suffield taught me to be eager, to be independent, and to pro prioritize hard work. Suffield showed me that the single image I had of myself was wrong, and only I had the power to change it. I would, have never try I would have never tried to focus on the world outside of baseball if I didn't have teachers who helped me and expected me to overcome my limitations in the classroom. I know now to trust myself as a student the same way I trust myself as an athlete. I have learned a kind of independence and confidence that I've never learned on a baseball field. When someone asks me what I want to do when I grow up, I know that I have options beyond baseball. These options exist because I recognize the problem, focused on changing, and had a community that believed in me. So finally, I would like to take the time to thank a few members of our community who helped me realize that I'm more than just a baseball player. First, thank you to the people who were in that admissions room in 2018 and found me worthy of being a member of this community. 
I'm extremely proud and excited about where my four-year Southfield journey has taken both me and my family. Nothing makes me prouder than being here today for a lot of reasons. Some having to do with me, and some having absolutely everything to do with the gratitude and patience of the people that guided me through my four years here. Senora Lopez, who taught me for three years straight and was my dorm parent in Spencer. Despite what you might often tell me, I know you wanted nothing more than to see me in your class every year. In all seriousness, I thank you for the patience you had with me throughout my years here, and I promise you I'll try not to walk on the grass for the remainder of the year. Mr. Brissett, who by the way did go to Harvard, <laughs> I don't know where to begin my thank yous. Whether it was you helping me map out my next few years ahead, supporting me through coursework, or trying to figure out in the nicest way possible how I couldn't see a goalpost in the middle of my cross-country trail freshman year and run straight into it. <laughs> Throughout all the bumpy roads and bumps on my head, our relationship has definitely brought us closer. I thank you for always seeing me as my strengths and not my weaknesses. Thank you for your support and guidance and always reminding me to be where my feet are. Mr. Setian, the time I had with you might have been short, but I have high appreciation for the insight and guidance you gave me, not just in the weight room, but as an individual. Seeing the ambition you carry with you in your everyday life inspires me, and you never fail to put a smile on my face. You're the perfect example of the happiness that comes from hard work. I was 11 years old the first time I heard about a kid from Lower East Side who not only holds the single game rushing record at Bates, but who's idolized throughout the Boys Club in New York for his tenacity, commitment, and selflessness. Mr. Atkins, the journey you took getting to where you are today is often overlooked, but I learned at a young age about you. The man who faced hardships in his youth and overcame it to seek an opportunity in sending kids to independent schools all over the country. It's a privilege to stand before you today, seven years later, and tell you that you exceeded all my expectations of the great Sean Atkins. For everything you've done for me, and really for everything you've done for kids just like us, thank you will never be enough. Mom and Dad, thank you for instilling me with a strong passion for learning and for doing everything possible to put me on a path to greatness. I'll never forget the important values you passed down to me, and words can't describe how much love I have for the both of you. You both have believed and always believed in me, and I owe all my success from this day forward to you. Thank you. Excuse me. Hi, Southfield. My name is Spencer Nassar, and I'm a postgrad from Rockville, New York. Today, I would like to address a main theme of my life through the lens of one of my favorite movies. That theme is independence. I will start off my speech with a quote. According to all known laws of aviation, there is no way a bee should be able to fly. Its wings are too small to get its fat little body off the ground. The bee, of course, flies anyways, because bees do not care what humans think is impossible. When I say independence, I don't mean being able to do stuff alone, because I definitely cannot be alone for a long time unless I'm taking a nap. The B movie is a perfect representation of the independence that I mean. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, I will give a short summary of the movie. Shortly after graduating college, instead of working in the honey industry, Barry B. Benson decides to explore the outside of his hive. When outside, he discovered that humans have been exploiting bees and stealing their honey. Barry ends up freeing all the bees from human exploitation, and the bees eventually reclaim their honey. When I say independence, I mean the willingness to be different. As a student fully prepared to go attend college, I decided to come to Suffield at the end of July 2021 while I was on vacation at the same place uh, as the yacht club that Manson spoke about in his, his chapel speech. Choosing Suffield was relatively easy after visiting the campus on a warm summer day, but it was all the more clear that this was the place for me when I met the other postgrads. Without these guys and our fearless proctors, Ryan and Cooper, I cannot say my experience would be the same. Choosing to take a postgrad year is definitely not a traditional option for most, but I can definitely say it was worth it. Just like Barry B. Benson, I, along with the other PGs here, took an unorthodox path to becoming who I am, and that's something I'm proud of. I'd like to thank my roommate Jackson, 
and my PG brothers, Sean, Paul, Mansfield, Colby, Jake, Finn, Ford, and Jack for making this year unforgettable. I'd also like to thank Mr. Andrews and would like to apologize for the shenanigans in the dorm when you're on duty. To Ms. Lopez, Montega sus manos y antenas adentro de tren via en todo momento. That means please keep your hands and antennas inside the tram at all times. <laughs> and to Mr. Viani, thank you for such a great year in English, and I apologize for failing this morning's reading quiz. <laughs> My message to all of you today is this. Don't be afraid to be yourself. In the words of Barry B. Benson, yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black, yellow, black. Ooh, black and yellow. Yeah, let's shake it up a little bit. Thank you. a second year senior from Peace Hall Middle, Massachusetts. First off, I want to thank my family because without them, none of this would be possible. I would not be in the situation I am today without them and can't thank them enough. Starting with my brother, the hours we spent training and working out were some of the best memories I have. After games, early mornings, it didn't matter. Next, my parents, the amount of support they have given me is endless and I can't thank them enough. Some of the most fun I had was playing for the high school I grew up, grew up rooting for as a third grader watching all the high schoolers going crazy on Friday nights. This is something every young football player dreams of, Friday night lights. The thought of attending a prep school never came across my mind until the middle of my junior year at East Hall Meadow. The thought of leaving some of my best friends was the hardest decision I have to would have to make. Leaving the same kids I knew since second grade, playing multiple sports with them my entire life was going to be a hard pill to swallow. As well as leaving some of my favorite coaches I've ever had, one of the coaches at my old high school, Coach Bedard, is a living legend at Eastall Meadow. And in my first year at Eastall Meadow, we had a special relationship. Look, relationship. He was the first coach I met and knew he saw something in me. We both would, would be the first to practice, last to leave. Whether it was taking early work, getting ground balls, hitting, or just talking baseball, he was always there. One of the most important lessons he talked to me during a game was during a game during freshman year on a strike free call I did not agree with and tossed my bat. He immediately pulled me to the side and said, hey, winners control their emotions. Never get too high and never get too low. They are competitors and let their best speak for them. Some days you're on and some you're not, but it's not about how you react when the good that matters, but how you react when things don't go your way because that shows true character. This is something I take with me till this day. Anyone can act happy when things are going good, but staying positive in the bad is something I take pride in because that is when our true colors are shown. Another important lesson he taught me was right after my sophomore year, when I started talking about colleges with him, he explained, it's not how you start that matters, but how you end. His brother never started a high school game until his junior year, yet was a first round draft pick for baseball. And same with him. He didn't start to later on his, in his career, and was still ended up being a draft pick. I was confused at first, thinking you had to start early on to be quote, good enough. However, he explained differently and went on talking about, it's not what you do when, it's what you do when nobody is watching that counts. A lot of players rely strictly on true talent, talent, and that's good at first. But he explained, it's the ones that show up every day with the same mindset of being a better version of themselves than the day before, and that's the ones who go far. So having to make the choice to leave all that was definitely hard, but I knew that if I wanted to be where I am today, I had to make the switch. And going from a public school to prep is definitely one of the hardest things to do. The long days and hard practices have prepared me, prepared me well for what's next in my academic and athletic career. One of the first coaches I met here was Coach Brown. He helped me make the switch a lot easier as he is someone I can always talk to on and off the field. And I know that won't change after I graduate. He has helped me become a better person and I know that won't, and I know that after graduation, if I call him, he'll never hesitate to answer. And soon I would meet another very helpful coach, Coach Brissett. He has taught me a lot on the baseball field and also so many valuable life lessons. He explains how nothing is given that no one is deserving of anything rather earned. If you want something, you go out and work, and you go out and get it. Attention to detail, preparation, is something I will take with me to college. Coach explains that the more preparation you put in will limit the amount of nerves you get in game, because you have arrived until you can't get it wrong, not until you get it right. Doing the little things and paying attention to detail will go a long way. Nothing in life is worth having without hard work. Put in the time and you will accomplish anything. Thank you. Hi, Southfield.
My name is Uno Sanguinson, I'm a, and I'm a four-year senior from Microsoft Teams. <laughs> this speech is dedicated to Hugo Lee for no apparent reason. <laughs> I like to use the three to five minutes I have to talk about my family, specifically my siblings. I'm the youngest of four brothers, so there's much that I can't say, but to be blunt, we're a couple of smart knuckleheads that somehow managed to get along. You can learn from the best, and you can also learn from the worst which is why each of them have been able to give me some meaningful lessons. Lessons I want to share with you guys today. Let me start with Yozua, the second youngest brother. Some of them might know you, some of him, some of you might know you. Some of you might know him as Trip. Yozua is special in his very own way. He's very knowledgeable, and actually the medic of our group. Whenever someone gets a Q-tip stuck in their ear, or a fresh wound, Yozua is who you call. The one thing I don't understand, though, is that he's always thinking, or at least looks like it. I don't know what goes on in Yozman's head, but I do know that he always has a master plan. Yozman taught me that you should always have a plan B, and that every day you should keep working towards your goals, one way or another. Next in line is Cart, the second oldest brother. Cart is much older than me, but it's like we're best friends. No matter what, Cart is always himself but at times a bit too much himself. Out of all of us, I would say Carr's the most driven. When he puts his mind to something, he never fails to get it done. Apart from getting to places on time, he's the most consistent one. Out of all the crazy adventures we've had together, the lesson that comes up every time I think about Carr is to always think and do. Take as many risks as you can and never set a limit for yourself. Now Lee, Lee's the oldest one. He's the prime definition of go big or go home. Everything he does, he does to the absolute maximum. That can definitely be hard to deal with. When I understand what he's saying, we get into really deep conversations, and I'm really thankful to him for making me realize the value of time and how I should use mine wisely. All jokes aside, I love each and every one of them. Massive shout out to you boys when you are watching us. I'd like to end this speech by thanking my mom, my dad, Mr. Cannon, Mr. Lynch, my advisor, Ms. Nigro, my teachers, my friends, and everyone who's taken care of me during my time here at Southfield Academy, including whoever puts the chicken breast in the salad bar every day. <laughs> I've been fortunate enough to meet more brothers and sisters during my time here at Southfield. So to the freshmen, I hope you all find your own second family here, and maybe you could learn a thing or two from them. Thank you. My name is Andrew Denno, and I'm a four-year senior from Jamaica. My name is Kelsey Nemeth, and I'm a four-year senior from Suffield. Today we'll be talking to you about our favorite person on campus, our advisor, Ms. Cook. If you don't know who Ms. Cook is, she's the lady standing in front of you with the camera filming traffic. <laughs> Ms. Cook works in the marketing department, and she takes videos at games and other school events and posts them online. Ms. Cook does so much more than just that, though. Although you're my third advisor at Suffield, you have made the most impact on my life and development as a student and an adult. When I switched into your advisory, I didn't expect to have someone that cared about me and treated me like their own family. You were constantly reaching out and asking me how my life is going, and when I run into you unexpectedly around campus, it always makes my day. The positive interactions you have with students is something you may not realize impacts us beyond the moment. I remember moving into Rome my freshman year, where I met my first set of dorm parents, Mr. B and Ms. Cook. Ms. Cook was really the greatest dorm parent I've ever had. I remember the times when we would come back from an adventurous Saturday night around campus to a huge bowl of pasta being cooked for the whole dorm. I also used to go visit her apartment during the nights that Mr. Stone was on duty in order to avoid doing Mr. Crosman's physics homework. At this time, Ms. Cook was not my advisor, but would still try to help me in any way that she could. Ms. Cook quickly became a mother to me while I was away from home. She would message me every day just to see how my day was going and to check in. This communication was a continued reminder of how much she cared. After Ms. Bennett's left, I was nervous to pick someone new as my advisor. Ms. Bennett was the only teacher I really connected with outside of the classroom, and I really had no idea who I could create another strong bond with. My sophomore year was cut short without a spring term due to COVID, so I really didn't didn't have time to develop a relationship with another faculty member. I knew Ms. Cook was a welcoming person and her advisory group was small. I just decided to join and I'm so thankful that I did. 
I look forward to our advisory dinners. They're full of catching up on our lives, lots of laughs, and listening to Miss Cook's scary imitation of her cat. There were also many times I was tasked with looking after Miss Cook's son, Jamil, while she went to meetings. This was challenging for me, as I've never had to take care of a five-year-old that looked like he was big enough to be in middle school before. <laughs> Nevertheless, I persevered and managed to be in 10-0 in FIFA. Although he lost, he still played better than Chris, Josh, Declan, Mackay, Jonah, or Ford. Or <laughs> Having Miss Cook and Jamil in the dorm really made myself and the others in the dorm feel like a family. Living in Rowe was honestly the best dorm I've ever lived in. It was an amazing way to transfer into school away from home. Thank you for always being there when I need someone to complain to, laugh with, or just a friend to talk to. I am so grateful that we have become so much closer throughout the years. I know that we'll stay in contact when I go off to college. You have taught me so many things without even realizing. One of them being that when life gives you obstacles, no matter how big and terrifying they are, you can persevere and come through even stronger. After being with you in an unimaginable situation, I have realized that the most unexpected things can happen at any moment, and you can get through them. It is possible to remain strong. You are one of the most inspirational women I know, and I look to you for guidance. Although graduation is only 40 days away, I know that will make every single one of them count. Ms. Cook, thank you for all you've done for us. Ms. Cook, I hope that you realize the impact you've had on us. I hope that you continue to inspire others the way you've inspired us. I hope you forever continue to be you. Thank you. My name is Basmira Basnan and I'm a two-year senior from Malaysia. Years ago, I watched an ad on TV. Usually when ads come on, I would switch channels to see what else is playing. However, this time I watched this entire ad. It was three minutes long and it was in Thai, so I didn't understand a single word. But every single second of this ad was impactful. If I could show you this ad, I would, but instead I'll narrate it to you. A while ago, I found this ad on YouTube and it was titled The Unsung Hero with over 110 million views. Scene one begins with a man walking down a street when suddenly a stream of water lands on his head, where he looks up and notices a pipe broken and a stream of clean water spilling to the ground. He stops and see, sees that there's a pot of dying plant a meter away from him, so he picks it up and angles it under the spilling water. Scene two is an elderly woman pushing, uh, struggling to push a cart of food over a sidewalk, so he proceeds to run after her to help her lift it up. Scene three is the same man having his lunch break, a plate of rice, chicken, and soup. As he's eating, a dog comes over to him. Without hesitation, the man picks up the chicken and feeds it to the dog, while the cook looks over at him disapprovingly. Scene four is a mother and daughter sitting, sitting on a pavement, begging for money, and the daughter has a sign written, for education. He takes out his wallet and gives them his money. Scene five is him returning home after work, but he stops by his neighbor's home, where he hangs a bunch of bananas on her doorknob. An old woman peeks out to reach for the bananas. These five scenes are repeated. It's another day. He passes by the plant. It's not as dead as it was before. The lady isn't trying to push the cart anymore. She's simply looking around for it, wondering where this man is. He giggles and proceeds to help her. The dog is back during his lunch break, and he surprises the dog. Instead of one drumstick, he now has two. He sees the daughter and mother again and gives them money again, which the daughter relu reluctantly accepts. The neighboring grandma walks out confused again, wondering who keeps leaving her a bunch of bananas. The emotional music in the background tells me that the ad is wrapping up. He's finished up his lunch, but now the dog is following him. He stops to give money to the daughter as usual, but he suddenly stops. He realizes that she isn't there, where she usually is, sitting by her mother. He hears her call her mother from a distance. He turns to see her in a brand new uniform and a backpack. She stands there smiling at him. This time, the grandma catches him before he runs away. With, one, with the bananas in one hand, she gives him a tight hug. The plant is now flowering. Throughout this ad, the narrator asks viewers to reflect. What does he get in return for doing this every day? He won't be richer, he won't appear on TV, still anonymous and not famous. What he does receive is emotions. He witnesses happiness, he reaches a deeper understanding, and he receives what money can't buy. A world, a, a world made more beautiful. This ad has always served as a reminder to treat everything and everyone with kindness and respect. It's more important to be rather than to seem. 
Um, it doesn't take much to bring a smile to someone's face. Remind each other that we are a community that prioritizes empathy and compassion towards one another. A helping hand or a simple show of compassion can turn someone's day completely around. No matter how small, an act of kindness never goes to waste. Thank you. Hello, Sophia. My name is Luke Vilich Sinzel, and I'm a four year senior from Marin County, California. The idea of boarding school was first introduced to me by my grandfather when I was in seventh grade. Four out of his five kids had gone to boarding school, and he wanted nothing more than for me to go as well. When I first began looking at boarding schools, I only had two on my radar, Suffield and Lawrenceville. As a naive 14-year-old, the thought of leaving home was incre incredibly intimidating. I would be leaving my family, friends, and essentially my life as I knew it. This was scary, and it was hard for me to wrap my head around this new reality. However, upon much deliberation and back and forth, I decided I'd stay home and attend my public high school. Flash forward one year later, and there I was, in the same position as before. It was just as scary and just as hard to make that decision, but after a year of public school, I knew I belonged somewhere else. So three days after the deadline, I finally told Mr. Atkins I was ready to become a Tiger. Coming all the way from California, I was incredibly nervous and worried about how I'd adapt to this new life. I had been away from home many times before, but never like this. Home was now 3,000 miles away, and there was nothing I could do about it. I remember meeting my roommate for the first time, walking down the hall in Centurion. My eyes locked with another kid, and he eerily reminded me of a small kid Russell from the movie Up. Sure enough, when I looked down at his name tag, it read Jonah Ball. <laughs> Now I can give you a quick rundown of my freshman year, and I would, but that has already been done so graciously by John. Unfortunately, there's not much else to tell, and although it pains me to say this, he nailed it. It was Fortnite here, Fortnite there, Fortnite everywhere for me. So thank you for that, John. Yet the spring term, I finally started to integrate myself into the social scene on campus, and to my surprise, people were pretty interested in me. I like to think it was because I was an interesting guy that had interesting things to say. But I'm pretty sure it was because that it was just because it was the fact we were three two thirds of the way through the school year and most people only knew me as, and I quote, that kid who plays Fortnite. <laughs> However, once the cross season rolled around, I found myself feeling more comfortable and content than I had been the previous two terms. And although I do not regret the time I spent in the dorm freshman year, I'm glad I managed to find myself some of those friends that Jonah that Jonah keenly noted I didn't have to start the year. I encourage all of you to step outside your comfort zone, leave your fortnight behind, and find your place here. Southfield is a special place, and although it was a rough beginning for me, I found comfort in calling it my home, my home away from home, the last four years. I could not imagine a life without Southfield, or without the memories and relationships I have formed here. There are special people here, whether it be those who throw themselves off 40-foot cliffs in the feet of powder, or those who are deathly afraid of needles. Suffield is a place where these special people can form relationships that will last long past Suffield. Lastly, I want to thank my parents. Dad, John, thank you for being supportive and having me back through all the things I've done. Mom, thank you for always being there for, there for me when I need you. And I'm not sure I, where I'd be without you. I love you guys. Thank you. Good afternoon, Southfield. My name is Ben Warner, and I'm a four-year day student from West Andrea, Connecticut. I wanted to use my time today to talk about my grandma. My grandmother passed away on December 10th, 2021. While we are obviously sad that she has passed, it is only right to celebrate her life, her remarkable life, in the most upbeat manner. I'd like to start by reading her section in her college yearbook, Catherine Wendell Townsend. Wendy's unbeatable exuberance knows no bounds. She's a lovable bug with an undying urge to take a snapshot of everything around campus. You've seen her look like a thoroughbred dog, acting like the epitome of good nature, telling funnies. If you sit with her at meals, be prepared to order seconds. If you sing in her barbershop quartet, be prepared to go off key. Think of her and you think of lovely shop, skiing weekends at Torin, that fine Italian hen. Her prowess at hockey, 
busy, 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 but isn't it exciting? Fascinating courses, fascinating professors, fascinating life. That's our Wendy. Wendy, who's nicknamed Skinny, received her name after my uncle decided to call her Tubby, which, as you can guess, was shut down very quickly. Skinny left an impact on everybody she met. Through her passionate connections with all and her lively spirit, Skinny was a life of gatherings and the heart of many amazing stories. However, there are some moments where Skinny made some questionable decisions. Skinny once abandoned my mom, who was eight at the time, on a ski mountain in Vermont. My mom got stuck on the wrong side of the mountain at closing time and was forced to walk down the highway around the mountain for four miles. My mom, as an eight-year-old, decided to get into a stranger's car and hope that they brought her back to Skinny. When, when my mom finally made it back, all Skinny said to her was, why are you upset you made it back here? Another unbelievable story occurred when my mom was even younger. My grandma used to run the Arts and Crafts Center at their summer camp in Canada. To remain distraction free, she would leave my mom attached to a pole with a tether. Um, it's no surprise I have such a resilient mother. Um, so maybe it's only right that nowadays I'm grateful for some of these more bizarre stories. Skinny's life was full of action with constant skiing, hiking, and sailing. She traveled to over 120 different countries throughout her life. I could go on and on about her adventures. In fact, at 88 years old, my grandma was still paddling a canoe on her own. I don't exactly know where Skinny's resilience stemmed from, but she was fully committed to every passion she had. One of the greatest examples of this was when my family took a ski trip to Canada. Skinny, who was most definitely retired from the sport and was planning on snowshoeing while we skied. A couple hours later, as we took the lift up, my mom spotted Skinny flying down the mountain on skis. It turns out that Skinny had somehow managed to convince the private club at the base to give her, to give her skis and a ticket. Skinny had a great passion for the outdoors. Earlier in her life, she and my grandpa found themselves in Ontario, Canada, where they began building a wilderness canoe tripping outfitting business. This love for nature is shared throughout my whole family, which has given me the opportunity to experience some amazing places with the people I love. Saying my final goodbye to Skinny was one of the hardest things I've had to do. Losing such a significant person in your life is incredibly difficult, and I know we can all relate to this. When I was on that final responseless phone call with my grandma, I read her a short yet seemingly endless sentence she had written in a letter to my brother a while back. On to the next adventure. In this, I promised that I would continue to take life on, seeking new experiences and doing it with the people I love. I live for that next, next adventure, the opportunity to grow as a person and to learn important things along the way. I encourage you all to do the things you love with the family, friends, and community you love. Skinny's lifelong list of adventures has come to an end, but the stories and connections she built live on. To have Skinny as my grandmother is something I would consider an honor. Thank you to everyone who made the sacrifices and put me in the place to have this opportunity to be, such, to be part of such a special place. Thank you. Before my speech, I'd like to take a moment to thank some people who have been influential in my time here at Southfield. Ms. Grossman, thank you for the last four years of cross country. I'm going to miss our yearly preseason viewing of McFarland and watching you run by my dorm every morning in a neon shirt. Mrs. C, thank you so much for always being someone I can come to. The ceramic studio has truly become my second home. Lastly, I would like to thank Kim. You have taught me so much about life since we first met sophomore year. Throughout my high school journey, I have grown exponentially. With each event that has happened, I was able to learn a new life lesson that I'll be able to carry with me. One experience that I would like to talk about today is my hike up Mount Humphreys in Arizona during running camp this summer. The cold wind hits my face while the sun beats down on the top of my head confusing my senses on whether I should put my gloves on or shed a layer. As we hike up the ridge line, trees slowly begin to disappear, and I look down, seeing small birds in the distance that circle below me. 
A rock sticks out from under my footing, forcing me back into reality. Without a trail marker in sight, my stomach begins to drop as the once stable and marked trail contorts into an upward field of loose and jagged rocks. The group slowly begins to pull away from me as I stumble to find a secure rock with each step. Every part of me wants to ask if we're going the right way, but I stop myself, afraid to act, sound as if I doubted my counselor's leadership. My heart skips a beat as another rock slips from beneath my foot and falls down the face of the mountain. I look back and watch as the rock turns into a tiny pebble in the distance. While I didn't think this experience was worthwhile at the moment, it has become clear, looking back, that hiking Mount Humphreys helped me see that having confidence in yourself allows you to find the right path. My inability to speak up left my friends and I stranded. It terrified me to find myself surrounded by people who knew as little, as little about the trails as I did. However, this fear turned into a life lesson. There was no reason to follow someone that was just as lost as we were. As my group and I turned away from the path that the counselors had taken, we were able to find and follow the trail markers to the summit, eventually feeding the other group to the top. This experience taught me that you can't go through life relying on others to pave the way for you. You have to be confident in yourself. When I stopped following the group, I utilized my own skills, paving my own way, creating a safer, safer hike to the top. At this moment, as a leader, I didn't feel confident in my ability to discover another approach to the summit. However, looking back, I realized that this fear was necessary for me to break out of my comfort zone. Thank you. often end up in the best kinds of stories. And those are exactly the kinds of stories that I'm going to be telling you today. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. This one is the one I call Guitar Story. Um, don't do what I do. I go down to the AMC Theater down in Plainville, which is where I agreed to meet this guy on Facebook Marketplace. He's late, great. Uh, and then he appears and he says, hey, I don't have the guitar. I was building a play set for my, grand, for my granddaughter. And then he says, but you know, if you want to follow me back to my house, <laughs> we can go get the guitar. This is absolutely where the story should have ended. Um, like I said, don't do what I do. So I said, okay. Um, I just want to say that I did call my friend immediately and I said, hey, this is the situation. He pauses for a couple of seconds and he really, he thinks the situation over. Obviously disappointed in my uh, brilliant choices. And he was driving really fast. This guy was driving really fast and um, we got there okay. We were on the phone, my friend and I, the entire time. Uh, even up until we uh, got to this guy's front door except for the part where I hung up on him. Yeah, I hung up on my friend, guys. Uh, that was great. So we get to this guy's front door. Um, I'm thinking there is no guitar. I'm starting to get scared. And the guy invites me in. And this is where I did make this hard decision to say, no, you know what, I'm okay. Um, good news, guys. I did get the guitar. We're all good. Uh, don't do that. Um, the next story is much cooler, actually. Um, I was in Vegas for a spring break, and my dad says to me, hey, you know what, let's take a tour on a helicopter. I say, you know what, all right, cool, let's do it. I'm scared of helicopters. That's, you know, obviously I was reluctant. The flight starts off normal. You know, normal tour stuff. We talk about, you know, how horses like to stand on rocks that are warm and how these are Joshua trees and how a big tidal wave made all of these mountains. And then he gets into the weird stuff. He gets into how everything is connected to Egypt. All of a sudden we're talking about conspiracy theories and we're 
however high above the ground. But my favorite one, my favorite theory that this guy has is that people back in ancient times used to mimic the ants. Yeah. Um, there were ant people who wear ant headdresses and used to burrow into the ground when they knew a natural disaster was coming, you know, to protect them. And then we really get into his personal life, which was great. Um, but also, but the, but, you know, my favorite thing that this guy said to us was, you know, I don't really care if I die, <laughs> but I worry about you guys. <laughs> He's still flying. <laughs> All right, so this last story that I want to tell is really the only one that matters, which is why I rushed through those other ones. And I'll tell you why. Because it has a happy ending. The other stories had endings where everything turned out okay, but this ending is genuinely happy. But before I wrap this show up, I want to say a few thank yous to some important people out there in the crowd. I want to start by thanking Mrs. Graham, who for always supporting me and being excited for every achievement that I make. Next, I want to thank the Gottwalses for being some of the coolest and kindest people that I have ever met in my life. And I want to say thank you to two of my closest friends, Scoots and Aver. Scoots, thank you for always being incredibly loyal, understanding, and for knowing how to make me laugh even when I don't want to. Aver. Thank you for being my number one hype man, for getting into crazy shenanigans with me and remembering every little thing. Literally every little thing. So, let's wrap this up. It was orientation day before my sophomore year. I arrived at the Southfield campus and joined everyone in the same room, this very same room, just on the other side of the divider behind me. And I immediately felt out of place. I was scared before, but now actually being there and seeing so many people who already knew each other was even scarier. But I pressed on, knowing that my ride had probably already left me to the wolves. I meet my mentor, and she introduces me to her friends. I'm still nervous, but I start talking to the leaders of each of these clubs. Joining some, purposely avoiding others, you know how it is. I'm looking around and I spot a sign for a baking club. I beeline it over there. This is the moment that changed my life forever. When I got to the baking club table, I meet two of the most important people in my life. I was greeted with the warmest smiles and a phrase I have never forgotten. We are the best two for one deal on campus. This was the moment that I met Mr. and Mrs. C for the first time. The rest of the story from this day doesn't really matter, and I don't really remember it all that well, but because the important part is this was the day that I met the kindest, most loving, incredible people in the world. Mr. and Mrs. C have helped me through some of the hardest parts of my life, and even though this speech has all been all about the scariest moments of my life, the scariest thing to me is never being able to repay them for all the kindness and love that they have shown me over the past couple of years. Mr. and Mrs. C, I didn't include you in my list of thank yous because I don't think a simple thank you would be enough to describe all of the gratitude and love that I have for you guys. You have made every bad day, every bad test grade, or every moment of frustration so worth it. And myself and everyone around you are the luckiest people in the world to get to know you. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And thank you all for bearing with me. The end.